Anything else about human beings? This is susceptible. You're able to fall into the convention. Okay? We're going to get to that tomorrow. So before we jump into that, no, that's, that's fine. Because that, that, that is, unfortunately, we, we always have that back in our mind, right? And it's always in the back of our mind is, you know, we, we fail to live up to what God intended. But before we get to that point, uh, I was saying the creation of man and woman, the fact that man needed a helper is pretty significant. Right? So we're, we're, while God originally created Adam, just Adam, there's that recognition of the need for community, relationship, right, between each other, but also between human beings and God. And all of those fit into this idea of, of humanity. These are basic beliefs about human beings, right? We're in God's image. That suggests dependence uh, as well. Um, relationship, character. God gives us stewardship of the earth, right? Tend the garden. It's not just kind of, you know, just do whatever you want. It's like you have a job. So, if you really accept that human beings are made in God's image, right, and, and reflect these kind of things, how does that change the way you think or act to other people versus if you hold another belief that either holds human beings as a product of evolution or, or looks upon human beings negatively, uh, like it was, uh, like there were originally a good, there was a good God and an evil God, and the evil God is the responsible, responsible for creating human beings uh, to destroy God's creation. And so let's say, I don't think there's any, there's not too many narratives I could think of that would fit into that, but let's just say that's a possibility, right? That some group has a narrative that says right, that God created this wonderful world and that was all, and then this evil God created human beings to destroy that. How do you, how do you look on, on human beings differently if you, you know, you hold this? Or how should you look on human beings differently? You have a responsibility that we're not living to. Okay, responsibility. Right, and one that we're maybe not living up to, that we need to do better about. Is there, I guess, is there a relationship being the evil God? I mean, yeah, it, it wouldn't necessarily have these these qualities. No, but I'm just saying, how did, if, you know, looking at the, the biblical narrative, how does that shape how we think, right? When we, when we look at human beings, right? How do we look at them differently than if we have some sort of narrative that says human beings were created for, for evil purposes? We'll see every person, uh, every person matters. Every person has the uh, life in them and that they, they matter to God and that they are special in their own way. A lot of times we don't really think about people like that and just kind of pass by. And, you know, but each person matters. Each person, each person has a place. You know, they're going somewhere after life. And, you know, it's our responsibility to look on them as a person created in his image. Yeah, the, the, instead of looking at someone and seeing the first thing being an evil person, right, or, or looking at a person and, and thinking only evil thoughts, we should, we should, we don't all the time, right? And that goes back to that we're not living up to what we're supposed to be. We should see a reflection of God in the people that we encounter. Why? Because this is supposedly the narrative we hold up to. Right? This is supposedly what we believe. This is supposedly what is our foundational narrative of existence. Is that people are made in the image of God. And all that that entails. And so when we look at ourselves and say, wow, I, I really don't look at people like that. I, I look at people with suspicion. Um, I, I, I hate certain races or I hate certain genders or, or if I hear certain things about somebody's identity, I immediately think how horrible a person they are. How much of this am I truly reflecting? Or have I embedded in my theology some things from other arenas, the political arena, the news media, friends, family that might hold certain beliefs like that. 
how much am I really shaped by what God says about creation and humanity, and how much am I shaped by what other people say, other groups, or, or personal experience. So, to break down simply, the first stage of the grand narrative is creation. But, what's that second stage? When we have creation, it's good, human beings are very good, but what happens? All right, so we don't live up to that narrative, that uh, that idea. Oh, community, forgot to head on that, that on the list. All right, so the second stage is that of the fall. Human beings falling into sinfulness. So. What does it mean? What does, what does Adam and Eve eating of the fruit in the garden, what does that tell us about human existence, tell us about ourselves, tell us about the universe? Okay, the, the, we're flawed. What else? We have free will. Amen. When we're created with that free will, when we are created to have a relationship with God, without free will, there's no point here. Okay, so we're bringing that the concept of free will again. What else? What are some other things that are, are affected by the fall? I mean, we're, we're, I mean, personally affected, right? Because of our condition before God. But what else is affected by? The sin entering in through human choice. Yeah. All right, there's death. For what? All right. Okay, so so death in, you know covers a variety of things, but um, who or what dies? Okay, yes. Looking a little bit more simplistic than that. What was that? Okay, yeah, well, Jesus is going to have to die. Like we die. <laughs> like, we have to die. We can't do <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, we die. What else dies? Because of sin existing in the world. We, not, I mean, with the relationship and all those kinds of things, yes. But there's, there's something else that's affected by this. Right. Death enters for creation as well. Right now, now maybe, you know, the maybe death would have been a part of the natural process of things for animals and plants. I mean, you're going to be, I mean, human beings were going to be eating the fruit and that kind of stuff. But I mean, death is a part of everything in creation now. It, it, it affects us as individuals. But it's also, you know, the consequences of what these few people did extend to billions and billions of people, of people because um, as of today, the most recent numbers, the death rate is still 100%. Everybody's going to die unless you know, the Lord returns. And so their decision has impacted everything. So, we see that with the fall, we have the existence of sin, right? Sin, we can talk about a variety of things. There's this idea of rebellion against God, breaks the relationship, as several people pointed out, right? Distorts creation. The, the, the creation was intended for one thing, but the consequences have happened to creation, right? Paul talks in Romans chapter 8 about you know, creation being given over to futility or vanity, right? that, that it is not, you know, that it too is disordered because of sin. It disrupts the character of human beings. All of these things are, are consequences of sin. So, 
So, before we get to God's beginning to make a plan and then carrying out that plan, how does this part of this grand narrative, how does this affect the way we as Christians look at each other, look at the world around us? What are some things we, we pull out of these kind of things? What are some lessons we can draw from from this component of our great shared story? Let's go back to that question of, of how we look at other people. We, we should look at them as in God's image but what does this component of the narrative, what does that add to how we look at other people? Yeah, that, that this is a part of, of every person's, you know, existence. That, that none of us on our own can get past this. And so we see, we should see within human beings that image of God, but also a recognition that there is something wrong in human nature as a universal. That universally we are flawed because of sin. So what does sin, you know, what's the impact of sin? Well, you know, it, just, it breaks relationships. Why is it so so hard to have good relationships. What? Good. All right, so on the one hand, it has that, you know, we're distancing ourselves from God, and, you know, that, that distance from God creates distance from each other. But we, we think about, you know, God created man and woman, brought them together. You know, they're these two, but they're supposed to be one. Why do we have so many failed marriages just in the United States? Or failed relationships? Selfishness. All right? Because we're people that give into selfishness, we're people that give into suspicion, to jealousy, all those kind of things because this is a part of it. And so instead of relationships being natural, being positive, all those kind of things that they would have been in creation, there are things that we have to work at because we bring sin into a relationship if we aren't careful. Right? And so we need to be careful about how we exist in relationship. Well, how do we then think about human society from this as well? Does sin... I mean, it, it twists our individual lives right? so that we're not living like we, we should. We're not living uh, the way God wants us to. So what does this tell us about our human institutions, like government, culture, uh, you know, economics, right? All right, that, that no system that human beings try to put together is going to be perfect because you're trying to bring perfection out of gathering an imperfect, imperfect group of people. And so sin, this idea of sin, shapes even how we should think of human society. It doesn't necessarily mean we have to be negative about society, not very pessimistic, but it does recognize we need to be realistic about what human, society, what human institution can do to alleviate this problem. Right? And so when we think of things like poverty, racism, class struggle, right, there's some things that social institutions can do to alleviate those conditions. Right? They, can, they can help shape society, encourage us to live better, but there's only so much it can do because ultimately some of those things reside in the human heart. And you can't get it out of the human heart through social institutions. 